Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is Equity and Access and features Dr. Sam Steen. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and joining me today is a very good friend, Dr. Sam Steen. Dr. Steen, an associate professor at George Mason University, and also he serves as the academic program coordinator. He was a school counselor for 10 years, and he is licensed as a professional school counselor. And he is the director of the Diversity Research Action Consortium. Dr. Steen is a fellow for the Association for Specialists in Group Work, a division of the American Counseling Association. Dr. Steen is also the recipient of the Al Dye Research Award and the Professional Advancement Award, both from ASGW, recognizing his outstanding efforts advancing the field of group work through research and development of a new and innovative strategies for schools, families, and underrepresented communities. Now, this is the best part. Recently, Dr. Steen has started serving as a principal investigator on a major project that was awarded by the National Science Foundation, which aims to advance programs, knowledge and skills targeting black males. Let me say that one more time, targeting black males in middle schools for better accessibility and higher likelihood for success in algebra one and future STEM related careers. How you doing, Dr. Steen? I am doing great, Dr. Butler. I call you Butler. I hope that's okay. You Thank do you. call me Butler. You do call me Butler. Thank but, but, you. Well, Thank we kind of go back a ways. I guess it's okay. I have some students who call me Butler too. I was like, you know, it's like, okay, they just drop the do- they just <laughs> drop the doctor and they just say, hey, right. Butler. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mine's more of a term term of endearment, quite frankly. So yeah. I love you too, Sam I'm Steen. Clear about that, yeah. <laughs> so I'm really excited about some of the stuff that you've been doing. And, and one of the things I didn't mention is that you are one of the esteemed first members of the ACA Anti-Racism Commission. So what's that like for you? Well, I appreciate the uh, invitation to respond to what that's like. I would say it's very new. Uh, it's so it's so new. It's so early in the, our stages of developing what we are about and what we're trying to do to help ACA on that broader sort of um, perspective or broader level. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, the people that I'm working with, it, I've I've learned so much just selfishly about who I am and what I'm about and how to articulate what I'm what I'm trying to communicate in that space. That it's been tremendous. Good. 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 So you've had a very, um, you had, your lived experiences have been pretty interesting. I followed you, you know, since we've known each other. Um, you've lived in Arizona. You lived, I, I want to say, and I, I might be wrong here, but for some reason, and I don't know why, I feel like you lived in Hawaii. <laughs> why, why do I feel that way? I know I don't think it's true, but why do I feel like you lived in Hawaii? I'm not really sure why, but I do know that when I was at a Hawaii, I was at an ACA convention in Hawaii, I I had um, applied to a job, I had applied to GW, and if I wouldn't have gotten a job, I was going to go back to being a school counselor. So maybe I was joking about, you know what, I'm just going to pack my family up, and we're going to move to Hawaii. If maybe I'm- that's what it was. Maybe that's what's sticking in my brain, right? That you were going to because for some reason that was like something in Hawaii was in your pathway. Yeah. All right, that could be it. I mean, we went out there twice, so right, that, that right. could be really much a part of it. So the, the very exciting thing about you is you're doing something that not very many people of color, especially black males, are doing in terms of getting grants. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. So c- can you talk about that experience? Because this is really a live experience. And this is something that you know we should be really applauding you for, first of all, because not very many people get them, mm-hmm. especially in counseling. And then for you to come forward with this, I mean, I'm very proud of you. So talk about that. And, you know, what what has it been like um, to, to kind of experience the writing of a grant mm-hmm. and then being a recipient of the grant? You know, there's a lightheartedness to our conversation, right? And so I just want to acknowledge the fact that you're talking about how proud of me 
I mean, it, it makes me warm. At the same time, the content and the stuff that we may talk about is quite serious. Yes. But you know, but I, but I, but I also enjoy having a good time along the way. So I just want to make that clear that even though we're chuckling and joking a little bit, doesn't take away from the seriousness. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. This is very serious, especially when you talk about enriching young minds, and especially black males who have also often gotten the the brunt of the stick, right? They're not yeah. given the opportunities to move forward in their academic career. Yeah. So in terms of grant writing, I would say the first time I wrote a grant, Butler, was um, <clears throat> first, second year, of, you know, uh, in academia, a major okay. grant. I submitted yeah. one to the Institute of Educational Sciences, IES. Right. And it took me weeks and weeks to understand even what the call was asking for. But I heard that writing grants is something that you probably should do, right? That's right. what I heard. Yeah. And so I submitted that grant, took forever to understand it. Wasn't a lot of infrastructure at the university to help me do it. I'm just scrambling, submitted it. Didn't hear anything for months and months and months. Yeah. I felt like it was harder than writing a dissertation, quite frankly. Yeah. And then I finally got the feedback. There were three reviewers and it was a no. Two of them said, this is awful. <laughs> Where'd this come from? Um, and one reviewer was like, wow, this is a very interesting idea. I wonder if you were able to do these different things. Could you, you know, uh, um, sort of make it better or-, or, or so They inspired you to continue on because uh, the other ones sound like they wanted to, to, to stop you in your tracks. Yeah, I think it's like any good reviewer, you know, they're looking for or any reviewer. I don't know, good or bad, that's a judgment. But the fact that they're looking for a way to reject it because then they can move to the next one. Right. So those folks quickly move through. This other person saw something there. <laughs> Okay. But I didn't write another one for another three years. The okay. next time I wrote one was the Department of Justice. And then it didn't work out as well. You know, not a lot of good feedback, but, you know, I guess sort of it didn't make that connection. Notice IES, Department of Justice. I've said nothing about mental health or counseling. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of grant opportunities in our field, which is some of the reason why I believe people don't actually um, pursue right. them as easily and, and, and capture them. So right. finally, right, over time, this grant proposal that I wrote for the National Science Foundation is literally the same type of grant I wrote for IES, the Department right. of Justice. It has been my research agenda from day one, group right. counseling in school spaces. And after working closely with the senior faculty at George Mason, we, we dialogue back and forth about this great opportunity, not just for me, but for people who haven't been in STEM. Like you get credit for not having a STEM background for this particular grant. And then I'm from an underrepresented group, check. And then my, am I willing to you know, take training and find mentors and folks out there with the money to help me retool myself to actually engage in this work? And the, 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 the stars were all aligned. It was like the perfect timing. National okay. Science Foundation, like many other organizations, took upon themselves to say, we're gonna put resources in this, these other areas that we were limiting. And let's talk about black, blackness, you know, black kids and underrepresented groups and those and things of that nature. So right. I submitted this grant knowing that no one ever gets their first grant. <laughs> hey, I, everybody, don't worry, Sam, you, if you don't get it, it's all good. Yeah. But I believe the timing, the content, and sort of my ability to articulate something that just is just who I am at this point. Uh, it was hard for them to say no. And I'm really, really grateful and, and gracious that the that that I actually got it. So when you say you're proud, I mean, I'm proud <laughs> when you say, you know, it doesn't happen that often. I recognize there's only a handful of folks who actually have written uh, towards the National Science Foundation and actually get, got these grants. And so how long is the, the grant um, for? Mm -hmm. It's a, a it's a two year award with a one year no cost extension. And so I'm literally in the midst of taking a mixed method research course to really understand how I'm going to, not just what I talked about in the proposal, but to right. actually make it happen. Right. So can you talk a little bit about why it's so important for us to start thinking about um, branching out in that way? Because, you know, I think maybe we tapped out on what we can do in the classroom and what we've done in other spaces, but as a social justice advocate who you are, you finding other ways that you can support and help kids. And, and that's powerful. You know, I appreciate that too, Kent. Uh, it's difficult to find funding in within our field, right? And if you look at the, the ACA division and then the ACA profession organization, and then some mm -hmm. of the divisions, they give out resources, but it's like 500 bucks here, a couple yeah. thousand here. 
Right. And quite frankly, it takes the same amount of time to write a $500 grant as it does a $5,000 grant. Because you look at, they're talking about, tell us about your budget. What do mm -hmm. you do with $500? But you still have to sort of describe that line item. So, right. so when you say, you know, is it important or should we, I'm not telling people what to do, but right. I recognize that within ACA, in our within our profession, there are not a ton of opportunities. So leveraging some of that tool those tools and skill set that we do have is refreshing. Some of the folks that I've talked to that are in the math field, in particular, yeah. this is the area I've been targeting, and Black folks, because that was part of the requirement to find people who could mentor you in that work, right. they're thrilled at the fact that I've been working on like racial identity development to some extent and helping kids feel better about themselves in these white institutional spaces. And now, we're infusing that and making that link to math and sort of undoing some of that baggage that we have, sitting in these spaces, not feeling comfortable, having to navigate both the content and the environment. I, I think it's beautiful for them to really be able to say like, this is helping make a contribution in areas that they hadn't considered because they're math instructors, right? They're mathematicians. They're not necessarily um, counseling or, or folks focus on mental health and wellness. Right. I think in a lot of the careers that we have, we always focus in on what the salient part of our career is, but don't think about the other intersections that we can really touch and be a part of. That's why it's, in, it's crucial to, to talk about the need to be more inclusive, to have cultural humility and all those other things when we are doing our work, because that's what's going to attract the, the students or who are going to attract our clients or black males per se into this particular profession because somebody is thinking outside of the box other than just, oh, I just need you to be a mathematician. Mm -hmm. I need you to do this and do that. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about mentorship and what the importance of, of that in helping people to learn how to kind of navigate the grant writing process and uh, hopefully getting a grant? Yeah, so I, I recognize that ACA is made up of both academics, right? We spend a lot of time focusing on academia and mm -hmm. also clinicians. So when you are referring to mentorship, I'm kind of hearing in terms of academia, that piece of the puzzle for academics and people who are PhD programs and want to teach at the university level. It's tremendous, right? The, the, the relationships that I've been a part of or have been nurtured in or have developed over the years, um, sometimes formal, mentorship opportunities, sometimes informal mentorship opportunities, they are, they are, um, they are overwhelmingly positive and, and have been uh, fruitful in, in my life and in, in the work I've been able to do. Specifically, mentorship and grant writing, I, ca I can't really say that I've had like people mentor me in that process. I mentioned the senior faculty member who gets paid to be an associate dean for research at the college level, took it upon himself to open the door for people to come. There was like seven of us that showed up. And by the time the grant was due, I was the last one standing. And it was like, so it took like months and months and months to finally get to literally, this is my dissertation, even though there were other iterations. So right. it, is tremendous. it has been beneficial in my life. But I would say in terms of grant writing in particular, I don't, I don't really see a lot of conversations about grant writing. No, and not very much. Let's be real. I got tenure without a major grant. Like I've, I've had many grants. So you can get tenure without it, but the sort of impact that what you're talking about we wanna make, yeah, it does take resources. And oftentimes the money and the resources that we put is sort of like put your money where your mouth is, right? Not to sound flippant, but now it's like, okay, so you got these great ideas. My uncle, the National Science Foundation thinks that this is a good idea now. And so they're gonna fund their nephew, Sam Steen in this one endeavor. And right. ideally it produces an opportunity to get more grants. Right. So what's your hope? What, what, what's gonna come out of this? What's, your, what's the bottom line? I have, to, I have to tell you that it's kind of embarrassing to admit this. You, <laughs> you, you asked, right? I'm, I'm gonna always keep it real with you, Butler, right? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of embarrassing. So two parts of my hope is, and you have to articulate it in this type of grant. The grant is like broadening the capacity for STEM related educational researchers, right? And, and what that means is like, we need more brothers at the table flippantly, right? And we need to help them re retool them so they understand even what you're talking about in the context, because I'm a mental health person, right? A counselor wellness, not necessarily no math. So yeah. the two hopes are for me are one is to, at the end of this grant cycle, no matter what the pilot looks like, 
because you have to do also a pilot study that right. the mixed methods course I'm taking so informs the conversation I have with other people, my mentoring, my ability to be a better researcher, no matter what I'm targeting. That's the first hope, right? Yep. And, and as, a, as a result, I will be retooled in this new invigoration about how to engage in this work in a way that I hadn't done before, that people wouldn't say was rigorous, right? So that was, yep. that's one hope. And then the second hope is that I not only get a $350,000 $350, grant, but like 3.5 million. And let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. This grant that's $350,000, when I look at the number of participants I said I might work with over the next two or three years, it's like about 60 young boys, right? Yeah. $350,000. They take all this money off the top. Yeah. Right? I'm just keeping it real. All yeah. this money off the it's top. Very real. You know, right? Right. So if, 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 if my uncle is the National Science Foundation, then my university is like my cousin, you know what I mean? And my cousin. The one that comes down and say, hey, 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 can you <laughs> let me, uh, can, you, can you let me, <laughs> I ain't never going to give back to you, but can, can you let me? <laughs> yeah, 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 right, you feel me, right? And so then you get down and get down to the kids who I'm really trying to help with. It's like, I've done the math the other day, it's like 17 cents a kid or something crazy. Well, on a $350,000, so we put in some other things, incentives and resources, but really the time and effort people could argue well, we're putting money in to do this. And what it dawned on me was like, if I'm not at the table, yeah. if I'm not at the table, right. then I can't even begin to do this. Right. So now it's not just the kid in the school. It's like the policies and the procedures. And the I practice. tell you, man, it's, that's the most amazing part of, of being an academic is that we don't really capitalize on our work. You sat there and did all this work to get this grant, <laughs> but who getting the, who getting the love? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and even then, you know, you know, hopefully it's more than 17 cents a kid, but you know, dang, right. You get this much of money and, and the only thing you can do is, is, is give these kids maybe a, um, an eraser. So it would be, so would, yeah, right. Erase, erase, erase this other answer over here and write this answer, right. So, <laughs> right. But that's the joke. But the seriousness under that is like you say, so my hope is I retool myself in such a way that when I apply and ask for more resources, because the National Science Foundation has continued and they're not the only organization poured right. into, wait, something's not right. Right. Finally, everybody saw all the stuff on TV that's going on. We're in the middle of these pandemic, yeah. right? All these things that are intersecting. Something's yeah. not right. Let's try something different. Let's try something different. And it's going to go away very quickly. And, and Sam Steen is speaking truth to power. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. And I think sometimes you have to put the comical spin on it so that people can see the absurdness. Oh, clearly. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that, but that's when I, when I find, I heard about these grants, but this is the first one, the real one. My GA makes more money than my GA. I told him, I said, look, bro, I got a young black man. I'm like, let me tell you, let me show you the numbers. Here's the item. Yeah. It's like $60,000, $70,000 for this guy to go to school. Right. Right. I, I'm grateful. He's grateful. It's yeah. cool. But, but the, the. So make it work. So don't, don't let, don't squander this opportunity. Right. Don't squander it. And then let's together look at ourselves as a resource now. So I'm yeah. not going to take away from there's no monetary value on what I'm saying in terms of the time I might spend or the idea right. that we might generate. Right, right, but right. when you look at the hard facts, yeah, it, yeah. it's important. And I think, you know, but you also can't put a value on the lives that you will touch. Now, you know, you, we, again, the 17 cents is a bit absurd, but the, but the lives that you touch because of the work that you're doing is that much more instrumental. Can you tell me a little bit about how come you got into counseling in the first place? How come you became a school counselor? A school counselor, <laughs> I would say um, I graduated undergrad from the College of William and Mary. Everybody always talks about that William and Mary. Well, I think you have some alliances there, some affiliate. Yeah. I did have some alliances yeah, there, yeah, so yeah. I'm not going to go there. So. <laughs> right. I had the luxury of, of, of growing up in the military family. So I was okay. born in Memphis, Tennessee, and then, and then we moved quite a bit across the U.S., and then in the second grade, we moved to Germany and I was there till I came back in like the eighth grade. So six years of my developmental stage, that's where I lived, right? Yeah. So eighth grade, I get there, go through these experiences, right? So I'm, I'm at William Mary as an undergrad. <clears throat> I'm about to graduate, have a 2.2. Like this guy, right? PhD, tenured, National Science Foundation. It's so well spoken. <laughs> 2.2. My daughter, she gives me a hard time she's like daddy 2.2 and yeah oh, i was yeah. on academic probation too 
I mean, yeah. right, right? Speak the truth, brother. Okay. Speak the truth. So, so uh, student athlete, about to graduate, had a part-time gig at Career Services, and I'm helping these clowns <laughs> get into grad school, law school, yeah. med school, writing, helping them write their essays in there. And I'm over here not sure what I'm going to do. I go talk to my advisor, psychology professor at the College of William and Mary, uh -huh. pulls up my chart. And he's like, you'll never get into grad school. No, he didn't. I mean, it, it makes me kind of emotional thinking about it. He's like, you, you're never going to get into grad school. And I'm like, yeah. okay. So I leave there a little bit bummed. Run into a, literally, this is how I know, I'm very spiritual. The Lord was looking out for me. Yeah. I run into a guy from Australia who taught at William and Mary in the psych department. Yeah. I run into him leaving this other advisor's office. And he's like, Sam, you look so bummed. Like, what's wow. your problem in his accent, right? With his yeah. accent. Yeah. And I guess he's used to me kind of being lighthearted, whatever, beat bopping yeah. and doing my thing. And I explained to him, you know, I just met my advisor. He said, I'll never get in grad school. He's like, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, you yeah. were in my class. He was like, you took my experimental research psych course and you got to be minus. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. It wasn't no A, right? You right. got to be minus. Hey, it's not about the A. It is never <laughs> about the A. It's you about the, the substance of what you received. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's some things I learned. So uh, he's like, uh, well, you know, you won't get, you'll get into grad school. Maybe you need to find the right one. He says, Ooh, my wife works at, in space, they call it School of Psychology and Counselor Ed, and she's teaching in school psych. Go talk to her. I think there's a counseling program for people who want to be high school counselors. That's just how he said it. And right. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I never thought about that being a job, right. but whatever. Talk to his wife. Then I applied to the Counselor Ed program. My letters of re recommendation were really helpful because the GPA wasn't that good. And the GRE scores were fine. I remember writing about the Byzantine Empire and they probably were impressed by that, right? So I get into grad school and that was it. I, I met an advisor. I'm not going to throw names around, but this woman, I met at William Mary. We're, we are, became colleagues and we're friends to this day. And she sold into me, unbeknownst to her in a way, it was the first Black professor I ever had from undergrad through PhD. You the got the name of no, no, no. You no. got the namer. <laughs> okay. If you're going to ask me the namer, it's Dr. Norma Davines. I knew it was Dr. Norma <laughs> Davines. You're going to learn today. You're going to learn today. You're going to learn today. <laughs> in a loving way, in an authentic way. I remember coming to her office one time asking about a grade and she chuckles like, Sam, are you sober right now? I remember her saying it. Are you sober right now? I'm like, yeah, I'm sober. I'm no, no, Dr. Dave Vines. I'm trying to figure out why I got eight minus on this paper. Can you help me? Right. So that's how real we could keep it, you know, from yes. the beginning. Always yes. a lot of respect for her. Yes. But then over the years, now I see sort of like the the sort of the impact that that one person made on me. I yes. can't make the assumption that every black professor I'm gonna get along with, and every black student I'm work with, like every black kid I work with in these middle schools are gonna think I'm cool. That's yeah. not how it works. But yes. the relationships and the seeds she planted in me, they really made a difference. Ben, you, you speak so much truth to that whole scenario because we have to understand that grades, while they are important, they are not the end all be all to what makes a person great. Look, you could have been 2.2 .2 sitting there doing something totally different that you don't want to do that you, dead end but look now, you got a grant <laughs> and you're doing work for people who might have been in your shoes mm -hmm. when you first started off. Mm -hmm. Over say, and over. Can you and say over. hallelujah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, so school counselor became you because of that. You know what's really funny? I have a similar story in terms of how I got into counseling as well. Mm -hmm. I was walking on campus after I didn't get a job that I was hoping for. And I ran into my major advisor who said, hey, and I don't know, like, you know, why would we have a conversation about me getting into a master's program when I wasn't even thinking about a master's program? Oh, and yeah. ended up getting into um, a master's program and look where I am today. So the, and so the, the power and the impact of that relationship. Of exactly, that. and I didn't know the person. No, I didn't know the person. To I did make, not know the person. To make or to break you, kid. Right. It could have been either way. Yeah, I had no clue who this person was. We just started having a conversation on campus. It was like some kind of divine inter intervention Absolutely. that came through and said something. So school counselor 
extraordinaire Dr. Sam Steen has written a book, Supporting <laughs> School Counselors and Students. Come on, tell us about the book now. So not only do you have a grant, <laughs> you dropping science and knowledge in a book. So tell me about the book. Well, you know, Butler, this ain't going to come out right. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm, all right, shut off. Let's just stop the whole recording because this doesn't make no sense. Sam, no, no, you better no. come correct. No, no, no. I'm just messing with you. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, don't stop the recording, right? Because I don't want to have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, it's not one book, though, Butler. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like that. It's like blessing and encouragement and the seeds that have been planted over the years are now starting to come to fruition. The first yeah. book proposal that I wrote, I tried to, <laughs> I looked at all these other publishing companies and looked at what they were asking for. It took forever yeah. to understand that, submitted it. Man, nah, this ain't good enough. Yeah. One of the ideas I had when I went on a uh, family reunion back to Mississippi, and there was this news article in this little uh, local store there, real small uh, convenience store. And it said, the state of Mississippi has never been able to educate Black men to this day. And I had just finished getting my PhD. So it was like 2007, 2008. And if I would have been born, my dad was born there. I was born in Memphis, but we moved. If I would have been born and raised in there, what my trajectory would have been. So that book started then like, hey, I want to do something different, you know, and make sure. But it wasn't really clear what the topic was. Fast forward, I was a member of this ACA writing committee for a statement uh, for diversity and equity around um, the brutal uh, police brutality and those things, right? Remember, and, and some of the work that y'all are doing now stem from not that statement, but that season. Yes. Anti-racism task force and those types of things. Right, right, right. So I'm getting there. So <laughs> one of my colleagues at the end of that writing experience invited me and two other people from that task force. She's a senior person, invited three of us. One of us said they couldn't do it, which I understood. I couldn't really do it, but I was like, hmm, this is interesting. This lady is like inviting us. And then the third person, she said, sure. So three of us wrote a book called Anti-Black Racism in Contemporary Society. So that's one of them. The other book you alluded to was Group Counseling Leadership Beyond School Count, Beyond Interventions, right? So right now, I know you facilitate groups, you taught the group class, but you don't just use group skills, you navigate ACA spaces using group dynamics tell, or yeah. group facilitation skills. And if you don't, I, I, I'm encouraging you to do that. And then this other book that um, we are working on, it's like my heart. There's two of them, but it's a part of my heart and it's a group counseling textbook. Okay. Yeah, and we're, so we're trying to dismantle it. We're trying to dismantle these theoretical frameworks we've been using over and over. Yeah. They're already problematic that you take an individual theory and try to apply it to group counseling. Right. And then now it's the same theories we've been talking, the same seven we've been talking about. So we're trying to move those out and say, we need to create a different theoretical framework. And the last one was back to the school counseling. My colleague and I at Mason, I shared the proposal, that very first one. She was able to wrap her. She's a young scholar, an activist. She's doing her thing. She actually took my book proposal from 2007 and thrust it in the 21st century. And now that book got picked up by Rutledge and will be done in April on that. So there's a school counseling text, a group counseling beyond regular interventions, anti-Blackness, and then this group counseling textbook that really squarely is challenging my colleague you the one who everybody has all his textbooks <laughs> throughout their program yeah. and then the one we recently lost this year so i won't throw names out there but yeah, you all I know understand. who i'm talking yes about. yes yes so listen sam steen has arrived you was arrived no 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 i will never i won't i won't co-sign on that i've been Why? Because I've been the same way, Kent, from day one. Well, let me stop that. Let me say, let me, why is the bad question? I don't want to put you on defensive. How okay. come, brother? Okay, okay. you said, what, what prompts me to say that? Is that what you're asking me? Yes, what prompts, what prompts you to say? to say that? Because you have to sow into yourself just as much as others are sowing into you. So what prompts you to say that you haven't arrived? Because you're doing some powerful things. I don't no, no, I'm not saying you can't be more elevated and time no, no, goes no, no, no. on. I, I think I think that so there's some spiritual thing that that's really having me react to that. I know, you know, we're at a place where, uh, you know, I can think about it, but it's like there's this idea of like it, he who is 
you know, last shall become first. So if you're saying, hey, I was last, yeah, that's fine. If you know anything about me, I, I built quiet relationships, right? I quietly go about my work. I don't want a public, like when I first got this invitation, even for this conversation with you, can't, you saw the text? I know, it was a moment. Yeah, like, time out, yeah, no, no, time out, no, nope. Okay, same <laughs> you hear me? So when you say I've arrived, I haven't arrived anywhere. I've been the same. If you're saying yeah. now I'm becoming more like public in some of the work. So some yeah. of those seeds that I've been planted are yeah. growing, fine, yeah. yes. But right. I, I hear you, but yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, Sam Steen, from once you become, from being a little military brat running around bases to right here, right now, the powerful things that you're doing, you, you are, if you haven't arrived, you, 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 you on the doorstep, right? You, you about to ring the doorbell. I'm so, on the bus. I'm not on the bus anymore. I've gotten you, off You're about to ring the doorbell. You're about to walk through and, and, and find your destiny. So listen. We are um, time to take a break real quick right now. Um, and we'll come back after this to talk a little bit more about this destiny that Sam still thinks he still has to find. So um, this has been the Voice of Counseling. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and we'll be back in a moment. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support, wellness, treatment, We're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. Welcome back to The Voice of Counseling. I am Dr. S. Ken Butler, and I'm here with Sam Steen, Dr. Sam Steen. So, Sam, you have been sharing a whole lot about your life and the things that you have gone through. One of the things that I'm so impressed by you about is that you have never, ever, ever been afraid to speak your mind and tell your truth. And so now we're going to do that. I'm going to get an opportunity to ask you a question about critical race theory. And I want to hear Sam Steen's take on it, right? So considering how important anti-racism work is and what we've been doing here in the United States, what we've been doing with American Counseling Association, um, especially in this current context, right? So now, I'm hearing that there's 33 states mm -hmm. that have proposed laws to ban critical race theory. We just heard last week that they took a book out, a mm. book about the Jewish Holocaust mm. out of circulation, right? Then I saw this, this um, <clears throat> meme that said, listen, when they tell you you can't have the book in the classroom, that's the best time for you to go to the bookstore and get it and have it just in your house. Mm -hmm. So tell me about critical race theory and, 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 and from that perspective, what are some of your thoughts about it and the impact that it's having on, um, on us, especially on school counselors? It's a loaded question, but I'm, I'm still stuck on, hey, Sam, you've never been afraid to speak your mind. And in a lot of ways, I see that as a compliment, but I'm, I'm just surprised to hear you say that because I don't really find myself outwardly having conversations to speak my mind. But I guess when I do have the opportunity, I pretty much try to keep it you know, what they say, keep it 100. I try well, to keep... yeah, speak your truth. So I'm not saying that you're out there trying to be a rebel rouser, yeah. but you are out there. And when you have something you need to share and say, you have not been shy of being able to say. I learned in my family that you have to be honest, right? And genuine. And if that steps on people's toes, then you deal with it. And sometimes it comes across as like, why are you whining? My brother used to say, I have an older brother, you whining, you're always whining. But really, I was just trying to communicate my feelings or my thoughts or my, you know, what's going on and yes. I want to hear from you. So yes, I try to do that. And I think it's easier to do that when you're building relationships, right? Yes. And a lot yes. more difficult when people don't know me and where I'm coming from. So mm -hmm. to your question though, it, it really is kind of linked in this way. I think some of the issue with critical race theory is that we're not defining it necessarily in the same way that it was intended for. Yeah. So people are lumping critical race theory, get rid of it, you know, cause it's a problem. We're doing more harm than good because they don't understand the premise of what it's about. So before wow. we get to anti-racism work, right? Let's try to think through sort of my words and co-create what I'm trying to articulate, it's right? Bad. This mm -hmm. idea of initially, right? Policies and procedures and processes and practices within the context of law, People start looking at it and they're like, wait a minute, something's going on. Where the, you know, when you then you add race to these issues and you start looking at the data, you realize something ain't right. So they're starting to right. critique 
how race is being used to oppress, hold back, hinder, move up to the side uh, within this context of law. Fortunately, educators, and I'm not going to say when or how or how long ago, I don't know the history in that the history in that respect, but today in which I find the conversation, uh, critical race theory, parents are so, uh, many parents are so afraid of like how this is, now you're telling, we'll say white kids that they are um, privileged and that is going to do more harm than good. That's not really what we're saying. We're not talking yeah. about people. In this yeah. case, we're not referring to people. Yeah. We're referring to policies procedures practices processes yes. that are racist that well that's how complex people co-opt the message right so yes. they went and took it to a whole nother level right or you're going to make kids feel bad about themselves well look what about the kids that have already been right. feeling bad <laughs> right right exactly right and then and then you go back to i'm kind of like losing my train of thought this idea yeah. though is if we were to call it like just a theory yeah i mean it's cool y'all just teaching no theory in school <laughs> you talk about critical theory, like, okay, you're getting into so what do you mean by critical? But yeah, like yeah. if we critique that there are some things that schools are doing that are leaving people out, I yeah. would say more people will be on board like that's fine. But as soon right. as you throw the word race in there, time yeah. out. Time out. Yeah. Now it's loaded. It's anxiety provoking. Why are you doing this? Bringing this up again. You're doing more harm than good. It's not fair. Don't go in there teaching my kids about these things. But I was well, they did that. it before it even was something. Uh, you know, if you had a test model, right, that went out and, and, and experienced what these parents are feeling and saying it's going to happen, I like, you're putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. Can we at least kind of let the horse get to the water for a minute before you sit there and cut it off at the at the pathway and you know and and nobody's trying to make nobody feel bad mm -hmm. what we try to do make people feel good we're feel trying better, to create an environment that are inclusive yes that's what it is the environment oh, inclusive and then inclusive excellence so yes. the more and more i dig into the work it's like wait a minute we're just pointing out that this wasn't right these spaces aren't <laughs> equitable this is not fair maybe but it points the finger at the it, it points the finger Stop taking them to Mount Vernon every year in Virginia and yeah. saying, right, the yeah. black kids ate over here. This is where they slept. And here's why. Stop that. Look at it yeah. in a different way. Yeah. And then and then we create room and space and opportunity for other people. So now yeah. they see themselves in a more yeah. positive light. Yeah, That's what the goal way. is. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, I mean, just society in, as a whole has been interesting, right? So people don't want to get vaccinated because they don't know what's in the vaccination, but they'll do a whole host of different things, right? They don't know what's in the ice cream they eat, but they'll eat it, right? But all of a sudden you tell them that something might help you stay alive and you're like, oh, wait a minute. No, I don't want, you know, let me get this ice cream. <laughs> let me get this ice cream, right? And so it's interesting that people don't look at, for their own best interests because they listen to what other people are saying in the air who don't have their best interests. And I think that's what's going on with the critical race piece is that people who don't have their best interests in mind, who want to still stay in the status quo or the dominant side of the society are, are making people go crazy. I mean, people are in school buildings going to district meetings with a... <laughs> I don't. I, I was going to say something that was inappropriate, but they go into these meetings with, you know, armed and yes. and and upset right. about something that they don't even know what don't they're talking really about. Know. Yes, and so I think the 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 thing you pointed out with the ice cream analogy and the vaccination and, yeah. and all that, I, I was skeptical. Don't get me wrong. Like yeah. I said, I mean, I'm I'm gonna think through. I'm not gonna just. I didn't buy it. Apple phone. Sorry. The first yeah. time it came out and right. I bought the big screen back in the day. Remember the plasma joint? It cost <laughs> I got one right here. <laughs> but that one probably cost you 300 bucks. This one cost me like $14, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then like a couple of years later, you can get them for free pretty much. Yes. So my point is, it, it, the analogy you were given, it reminded me that it's fear. It's, yeah. it's, it's real exactly. fear. You're afraid of what? Oh, yeah. And now, I was skeptical too. I was like, I was like, listen, I may get that vaccination, but I won't be the first one. I know I said that out loud. And I tell you one reason that I know that I made a switch to say, yes, I will get that vaccination. My sister caught COVID. Yeah. yeah. And I heard her. 
mm. on the phone. Yeah, sounding not awkward. ready to mm -hmm. give up life, but right. looked like it was happening. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, as soon as right. that vaccination is ready, I'm out. I'm, so I'm then, going. so then, let's uh, so going along that line, right back to the critical race theory, this idea that if we're saying, I'm saying, hey, it's based on fear that you won't even let us engage in a conversation. Let's first clean up the definition. We're right. not perpetuating racism. We're trying to dismantle racism. Right. We're trying yeah. to undo that, right? So yeah. wait, wait, wait. So we're so we're so the fear is preventing that. Let's have that conversation. And then you sort of had you needed evidence right your sister and then you switched and i'm saying the fear prevented you you got the evidence you needed they won't even allow us to have the evidence they're already putting up the roadblock because of the fear let's just experiment with it let's just yeah. see if it really does create this, yes yes let's do a little bit better let's have engage in a national conversation about really what it was intended to do right as opposed to the things that have been going on, right? You really think it's okay to create a slave trade or a slave auction in your yeah. school? That's right. okay. It's not it's okay. okay. Not, not for okay. any kid. For any kid. Right. Yeah. And so the funny part about that is this: like, when you think about it, I just want you to see me as a human being. I just want you to see my humanity. If I tell you mm -hmm. that this is hurting me. And that I would like for you to see things differently so that I can have ownership in this, that I can be included in the party as well, then what is your opposition to that? Because I'm not coming for you. I, I don't I, I don't care about that part of the situation. I want equity for myself and others who have not been able to get there. I think that's the thing. We don't always have that voice though, right? And also I learned this in the Anti-Racism Commission conversation recently. Uh -huh. We were haggling over, you know, what should we even be called moving forward? Cause there are seven, eight black folks on the commission. Yeah. One young woman who identifies as, as non-black, right? Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, so the dialogue about this and, I, and I'm sort of articulating like, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not racist. So why, why am I part of anti-racism? And then it sort of ebbed and flowed to, but we've all drank from the Kool-Aid. I can admit that yeah. and we've all read uh, material that was deficit focused and racist. So we have to do undo some of this internalized racism. So what I'm saying is that little kid that we are talking about in that space doesn't always have a voice. They might not even know, but we're smart enough to know. The people who are sitting at the table, they may be blinded or not choose to look. When I say blind, like they put on blinders or they may not choose to see what's going on, but they know and they can remove those barriers. Right. But we need more people, not just black and brown folks to be at the table dismantling these policies. We need yeah. all people to be able to do that. That's great. So so this, this question really kind of leans right into that, right? So we learn a lot, even from negative experiences. We learn from how others treat us and act um, a lot of, um, about the kind of person we are ourselves and, and who we don't want to be, right? So if you wouldn't mind, can you kind of talk a little bit about what have you learned from some of those most impactful moments? I'm just kind of like back to that, hey, are you sure it's okay? So I won't use names, right? Because then that, that, that's okay. So I'm going to try to trek along a short story. Okay. My first ACA conference, I think it was in Kansas City. Okay. Maybe it was the one before, maybe the one after, but I think it was Kansas City. And uh, my advisor was like, hey, you got to go to ACA. You know, you can meet the people who read these books or wrote those books. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. you're going to. So all these things, I'm like, really? That's That was never my style. You know, like I, I never was like, a, a, like, like really impressed by like superstars, I would avoid them. Yeah. <laughs> right? It was like, that's fine. You can get your signature. I don't want that. that auto right, 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 right. So, so I go to ACA and I'm like trying to embrace the moment. Like, wow, he's right. There are a lot of folks walking around like, man, this is so cool. And so there was a guy, black guy, prominent in the field, still around. And my advisor was like, hey, I want to introduce you. Just connect to this guy. So went, introduced me to him. And then my advisor dipped out and we're talking. I'm trying to talk like, hey, yeah. Your, your your work is really interesting. And he's just looking at me. Like, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I identify as, you know, this way and the work you're doing kind of overlaps with that. And I just, and I'm like, okay, well, nice to meet you. All right, peace. I mean, like, I don't even remember if this guy said anything back. I'm the one talking. Now, today I'm thinking, maybe he had to use the bathroom. You feel me? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm in the way, like, or maybe he was hungry. Maybe he did go call. 
Okay, so that's that. And I'm like, dang, that was awkward. I don't know about this because I don't really put myself out there like that. First ACA conference. That's fine. I kind of try to throw that back because there's all this stuff going on. Kind of remember what I said earlier. Like, can you really nurture a relationship at an ACA conference long term? Not necessarily. So I'm giving this person grace today. But back then I was hurt. My yeah. friend hurt and surprised. Right. So same conference later on that day, my advisor said, make sure you hit up the division, especially around lunchtime, <laughs> because there's food. You're, you're a grad <laughs> student and, you, you know, you don't don't pay for anything. Just trust me. So don't I pay for anything. <laughs> That's well, changing now this year. Don't, sorry, come, yeah, to, yeah. don't come to pay, the conference this year. Pay your membership, you know, but, you know, but I'm joking. Right. So so <laughs> we go. I go to, by myself, right, I go to the ASGW, Association for Specialists and Group Work. There's a luncheon and a wine and cheese event, something. I can't remember exactly. I'm in line, kind of quiet, first ACA conference, nervous. And this guy, prominent, I referred to him earlier today. I won't say the name. Hey, young man, how you doing? Where are you from? I'm from Virginia. Okay, what, what are you doing? You're at the ASGW, what are you working on? Well, I'm not just start my PhD. Did I? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, this is great. Sounds like all that just sewing into my life right in that moment you right. know oh you like pineapples i like pineapples too and you can probably tell based on my voice who i'm referring to right yeah. then do that talk a little bit he says one day i want you to review something for me now granted he might have had his own motivation but i'm a young black man in this space and this guy doesn't identify as black and he's like sewing into me in that moment so when yeah. you ask that question there's these two experiences my first very my very first aca conference Right. Now, 15, 16 years later, where I am today, I made a note to not be like that first guy. Okay. And I also made a note that just because the first guy was black, I shouldn't assume that we would have made a connection. And just because the other guy is white doesn't mean that we couldn't connect on that way either. Right. So right. I kept this open mind and I made a commitment. And if there's anybody out there who I've been the first guy, just know I might have had to use the bathroom, <laughs> but I've been more intentional about not doing that. So let me tell you, I need to speak on behalf of the first guy because I believe that I'm the first guy. And while I think uh, I am open and um, um, amenable to meeting people and all this other stuff, I am also an introvert, right? Mm -hmm. I am also an introvert. But as people see me around, like when I see you at a conference and we have now created this bond, there's a difference, right? So people are like, oh yeah, you're lively, you're this, you're that. Yes, around people I'm comfortable with. A relationship. That I have a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. But it's a small talk, not easy for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so to this, I mean, you, you first of all, you weren't that guy. I know. I know. I know I wasn't that guy. Yeah, I know the first conversation we had at, at, at William and Mary, and it was, I remember, you weren't married yet. And so some of the things we were talking about were the relationship. So I remember vividly that conversation. I ain't going to put you on blast, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. And then, and then, but this person, I would, the reason why I could say it was an introvert, because the reaction when I'm at the presentation and others are engaged, yeah. maybe I didn't have enough intellectual language to engage yeah. this person. Right, right. So I didn't see it as introvert. I saw it just more like I was a non-factor, you know, and I don't right. want to. Keep oh, I'm not speaking on behalf. I'm just saying that there are reasons there why are times where people says, are not able to engage with. Other I have people. forgiven this person. I have not held a grudge. None yeah, of yeah. those things. I've been gracious. Over time, they saw me a little differently, right? So there's been different interactions. But right. I, what I would say is that you, the question prompts me to say, I don't want to be like that, right? I want right. to make sure that those negative experiences I've had, I reframe them and build on them. And the yes. positive ones, I do more of that because it does. It can make or break somebody. It, it does. Really You're exactly right. Because you walk in the, So now you sit around here walking, um, thinking about this and getting feeling bad about yourself or whomever right because it just takes that one thing because mm -hmm. i think about it in terms of um you know the people who are who have died by suicide as of recently mm -hmm. who might have had a different experience had they not walked into that first person that you yeah, talked about that's right right mm -hmm. and that first person may have had enough of an impact or effect on that person that they would do something as um as 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 I guess devastating, mm -hmm. traumatic as to take their own life. I don't want to belabor the point. Yeah. But the idea that we talk about equity, yeah. right? We talk about inclusivity. 
um, it, it's not, I can't hold a grudge against the, the, the senior black faculty member. I can try to have this high expectation, but I can't. If there was a room full of senior black faculty folks, then I wouldn't have put so much pressure on him to- That perform, one, right? yes, you, you are exactly right. So I wanna be mindful of that, right? Yes. So this idea, the, the yes. young, the, the white guy, I mean, yeah, he's in his own, he's doing whatever. He's looking for people to help him write books yeah. here. So, so, so let me just really <laughs> acknowledge that- Different motivations. He, Different yeah, that piece, but at the same time, just right. recognizing there is some, we can make an impact, right? All right. So listen, man, it's the last couple of seconds before we got to get out of here. What gives you hope for our future, um, especially with regards to school counseling? Um, what gives you hope? Well, I was in school counseling, probably, I don't know if I could speak to the hope in that. Mm -hmm. I think that what I am working on is trying to articulate quietly maybe through some writing, through the relationships I'm building here locally in this state of ways to tackle and or weather this storm that we're in. Cause we're in a storm, right? These yeah. things are converging. So, so what gives me hope is that collectively we can have conversations like this. Collectively, ACA sees the need to go ahead and take a risk and put eight black people and a young woman from, um, yeah, I don't want to start making an assumption, but yeah. from, you know, that, that, that has a, an Asian descent background, you know, at the table, having conversations and be willing to go there and deal with the darts and the arrows that are going to come our way as if we did something wrong by trying to scrutinize and evaluate and dismantle some of these policies. Yeah. Those things yeah. give me hope that we can engage collectively. I believe in difficult dialogues, brother. And so thank you so much um, for being here with us today, um, Dr. Sam Steen. I will tell you and others who are listening, don't get wrapped up in who the person may have been. Get wrapped up in the lesson. Mm. Mm. And so Dr. Steen, thank you so much. I hold you in such high esteem. Butler, it has been my pleasure. Thanks for the encouragement. No worries, my brother. Um, this has been the Voice of Counseling. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and from the American Counseling Association, we say we'll see you next time. <laughs>